Hi, I'm Linda Mao, and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth, and I speak with Michael Darling, Chief Curator at the Chicago Museum of Contemporary Art, about the exhibition, Takashi Murakami, The Octopus Eats Its Own Leg. Now for Art This Week. Hi, I'm Linda Mal, and today I'm at the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth speaking to Michael Darling, curator of the exhibition, Takashi Murakami, The Octopus Eats Its Own Leg. Michael, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you for having me. I want to start by asking you how this exhibition came about and what made you decide to focus on painting? Um, so I was um, going through Tokyo, I think it might have been 2012 or 2013 something, and thought I would pop in to see Takashi and see what was going on in his studio. Um, and when I went into the studio around that time, I was just so blown away by what he was doing and how his work had evolved. And I just came back from that and came back to Chicago and said, we must do a Takashi Murakami show. And then, um, and of course, my director said yes, and she, she liked the idea. But, but then I, I wanted to figure out, well, how, do, how does one go about doing a show like this? Um, the last big retrospective was in 2007, 2008. So, you know, some time had passed. The work, again, had changed a lot, and I wanted to come up with a different angle. And I thought that if we just were to look at his painting, you might see, uh, you'd be able to incorporate this new stuff that was going on and tie it back to the old mm -hmm. stuff that people knew better. Mm -hmm. um, I think also on that same trip, I, w I saw some of these very, very early paintings of his, these Nihonga works for the first time, and those also really surprised me. And so that kind of got the wheels spinning, and that's where I came up with the idea to just try p focusing on painting. So I actually read somewhere that Murakami sort of resisted the idea of using that really early work at the beginning, but it was ultimately determined that it was sort of essential to getting a fuller picture of the artist. Can you tell me what specifically you see in those works that made it important for you to include them. Yeah, you know, whenever you read other books, you know, about Murakami and previous exhibitions, they always talk about this Nihonga training. Mm -hmm. He has a PhD in this traditional Japanese uh, approach called Nihonga. And, and yet those paintings nobody had ever seen, aside from maybe his fellow students when he showed them at his, you know, thesis exhibition. So I was, I was really happy to see them finally and to know that he had collected, either still owned them or in some cases bought them back and, and collected them. And, and I think you see this grounding in a very traditional Japanese technique. I think even if you th look at the painting behind us here, which is 2014 or something, it's obviously very tied to Japanese mm -hmm. tradition. So I wanted to show that he didn't just come out in the world with happy Mr. Dobe uh, cartoonish characters, but there's this other tradition that he started from that helps explain all this later work. Absolutely. I want to also talk specifically about one of the early paintings, the Colors One, mm -hmm. because I think that although it's visually really different from what most people associate with Murakami, there's sort of something of the, the scale, obviously, the materials and the cheekiness that is very you know, true to form. Can you talk a little bit about that piece? Yeah, so that, that painting is also very early, still I would say in the influence under the influence of Nihonga, but he was trying to break free from the rules of Nihonga. And so it's gigantic. Uh, it's really more kind of on the scale of Western contemporary art. If you think about people like Anselm Kiefer, Julian Schnabel and others that were working at that time, because it's 1989, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was pushing the limits of Nihonga and he came up with this, this very cinematic scale of a painting made up of multiple panels and that really became the format that he's, that he's worked with since that time. And um, there's all this modulation of color and things in there that again, it's funny that we happen to be sitting in front of this painting because all of this tonality that you see in this work directly connects all the way back to that painting from 1989. Mm -hmm. And so this is the first time that people have been able to see those two things in the same exhibition under the same roof and sort of understand where he came from. It's interesting to me because it seems to be the connection between the Nihongo, like you're saying, and it's also kind of like one of the earliest color field paintings, you know. Mm -hmm. So enter Mr. Dobe. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about that recurring character and sort of his first appearances? Yeah, um, Mr. Dobe, I mean, one of the things that Murakami says a lot is that in, 
in Japan, he really feels that uh, the cartoon artists, whether it's anime or manga cartoon artists, are really held in the highest regard within the, the society. And he also says, I don't know if this is totally true, that he himself was kind of a failed cartoonist and wanted to, to go into that, but he wasn't good enough, so he did Nihonga instead. I mean, so again, it's, it's probably his self-deprecating. He's very self-deprecating. Yeah, um, but he still wanted to participate in that dialogue and recognized how powerful it can be to have a character that's instantly recognizable and has a certain kind of cultural uh, capital in a way. And so he came up with this Mr. Dobe character, blending for sure kind of b bits of Mickey Mouse and maybe Mighty Mouse and maybe Doraemon and other things into this character. And I think it first appeared in 1991 or 92. Mm -hmm. And uh, also first in a very simple format, just this head on a, on a blue ground. And then over time, he, it just became this piece of putty that he could play with and mm -hmm. manipulate and became more and more and more complicated. Uh, and eventually even taking on sort of a self-portraiture-like uh, quality. Mm -hmm. So um, that was his first foray into creating a cartoon character. And now he's got mushrooms and, and flowers and, and the octopus, actually, as well. It's the new one. Yes. So then it's sort of the early 2000s, and he starts participating in some of these really high-profile collaborations, notably Louis Vuitton and Kanye West. Mm -hmm. And in this exhibition, you don't have any you know of those commercial items but you definitely have paintings from the same period that sort of reference that how do those fit into the and communicate with the other works in the exhibition yeah i mean that the um that big exhibition that was organized by the museum of contemporary los angeles in 2007 um had was sort of notorious for having a louis vuitton boutique inside the exhibition right. and so even though i feel like that part of his story is really really important i wanted to to kind of create a little distance from that and try to tell a slightly different story and of course he was way ahead of the curve and we see a lot of other artists doing that now that in a time when it was almost taboo that he did that um so so in this in this case there there are aspects of of that kind of repetition of, of imagery and motifs and things that you see in the flowers that you also see in the work he did for Louis Vuitton. And we also decided to include some works that he made around about Kanye West to, to kind of hint at his ability to kind of cross over into popular culture mm -hmm. and yet still remain true to his, his visual fine arts kind of roots. And so at this point, his arts, at the point where his art seems the most global and is the least maybe Japanese is the word, or he seems to be a global artist in so many ways. He's connecting to all these different traditions. He sort of has a refocus, I would mm -hmm. say, in the late 2000s, mm -hmm. back to Japanese art history. So not even contemporary Japanese art, but mm -hmm. the, you know, the Edo period sim symbols. And you look at even this piece behind us, which was the maybe 2010, and then there's this, this other piece in our gallery, the super stylized head with the kanji on the side. Mm -hmm. Was there a specific sort of impetus that you're aware of that had him sort of return to that space and those symbols? Yeah, and in, in talking with him and in the course of you know, working on this exhibition and looking at the longer arc of his career, it does seem like for him, 2007 was that big exhibition at MoCA. Right around that time, he also joined Gagosian Gallery. He also set a major auction record at that time, mm -hmm. was starting to do the work with Kanye. Like all of this stuff was bubbling and it, it became very kind of frothy almost. And I think he, it, it kind of made him kind of question like, what is this all about? Who am I? Where is this going? And so, you know, in some ways you could kind of describe it almost as a, as a creative kind of crisis or yeah. maybe a midlife moment in a way, <laughs> right. even though at that point, he's, I don't know how old he would have been, 40 something. So, so there already was a shift happening right at that moment, and you get the Daruma paintings right about that time where he's, again, as you said, trying to look back at his roots. He also has talked about um, thinking about mortality and longevity and like what, it, what does make an artist last the t test of time. And he thought ideas about life and death and big philosophical issues were things that, that oftentimes will be timeless and can carry an artist you know, from hundreds of years through time. Um, and so I think those, those pictures start to kind of go in that direction away from 
maybe more topical things about consumerism and capitalism and, mm -hmm. and, and image circulation and things like that. And then the other major thing that really pushed him in that direction was the earthquake and tsunami in 2011. So the, he'd been creeping in this direction and then that happened and then he really turned to historical precedents to, to guide him through his practice. Absolutely. So now we're talking, of course, about the Arhat paintings, and I would love for you to describe really what those are, because those are something really fascinating, and I think he sort of took it to the next level in terms of scale and also craftsmanship in a lot of ways. Yeah. So in response, he wanted to find a meaningful response to the tsunami and, and earthquake of 2011, and really was moved by the suffering and the destruction and, and, and that, that happened. Um, you know, people in his studio and his family, you know, were affected by it directly. And so he was, you know, trying to figure out what to do. And at the, around that same time, there had been a big exhibition about this, um, this sort of historical artwork called the 500 Arhats. And there have been various different um, approaches to that subject matter in the past. And Arhats are a type of Buddhist monk that would have gone through the countryside and kind of giving people solace and guidance and things like that. And so he set out to make his version of a 500 Arhat painting as a gesture of healing maybe and, and resolve or something. But in his case, he decided to make a, a 100 meter long painting, so 300 feet long. Right. And in order to do the biggest painting he's ever made, maybe it's one of the biggest paintings in the world, I don't know, uh, but you know, just crazy ambition and scale. And ended up having to kind of recruit art students from all over Japan to help him make this mm -hmm. in his studio. And so it, when it was finally finished, it was first shown in Qatar, actually, and then returned finally to be shown in Japan in 2015 or 16, I think. Uh, for the first time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's amazing. Uh, all of these Arhat characters are totally different from one another. They each have their own personalities. They have their own names, really, and they're based on historical figures. And just like Mr. Dobe, now he's got 500 new characters to play with. So he's made subsequent paintings where he's combining them in different ways, changing their robes and their hair and their eyes and their warts and their toenails. And, and so it's become an amazing painting generating uh, toolbox in a way to have all these arhats at his disposal. And so that's to me a, a large part of what's in the in the lower galleries are these gigantic mm -hmm. monumental pieces. Um, the arhat paintings specifically are fascinating because as you get close you, you normally associate scale with you know there's these broad strokes mm -hmm. as well but they also sort of re reward this like really intimate looking because mm -hmm. there's so much detail and um, I remember seeing a, a picture of of that piece in progress, because there are, like to your point, like 100 people working for him, and it would be impossible to make it otherwise, because mm -hmm. the scale and the ambition of this project is just insane. Mm -hmm. I also want to talk a little bit about the most recent works in the mm -hmm. exhibition. He completed a couple works for the exhibition, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, there are some pieces here at Fort Worth that um, are brand new that nobody has seen before, so Very <laughs> even exciting. myself, so it's, that is exciting. So um, obviously there's the really large scale, scale sculpture mm -hmm. and there's the Kanye bear that is this called graduation. Uh -huh. But I just saw for the first time, I didn't even see it in the catalog, this sort of a self-portrait of him uh, laboring under intensive deadlines. It's sort of yes. this hilarious sense of humor and talks about the artist, you know, in the making of this very exhibition in which we stand, which mm -hmm. is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Is that one of the, the latest ones? Yeah, that one, um, the, it was the yellow one where he's at a computer or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah that one um, debuted in, in Vancouver just prior to coming here. Um, and the thing that's great about that painting that also feels so different and unique about his practice is that he, he's become very open about his practice on Instagram in particular and showing studio shots and things in progress. And when he's sick with the flu or is going to the hospital for ex overexertion or whatever. So he's, he's yeah. really opened himself up to scrutiny in that way and let his guard down in a way that most artists of his stature don't really do. They don't feel like they need to or want to. And um, so, and even me, when he was making new paintings for our show, I, I didn't, I wasn't getting 
reports from his studio or from his team, but I was watching Instagram every day and like, oh my gosh, this thing's changing, and oh look at this, it's, you know, a different color today, and so um, he he's he's working these things out in a public way that's that's again mm -hmm. very unique, and that one too that had this much more confessional quality too, mm -hmm. that I I find that that's really it's really endeared people to him in a way that makes him accessible and and approachable. And, um, and I think as part of this, this continued popularity of his work. Absolutely, I mean, he's definitely, you know, there's so much humility, but also the, the notion of, oh, we're gonna have this great retrospective of my painting, let me make five more or something, mm -hmm. that he's not gonna rest on those laurels, so he's yeah. really gonna push the boundaries um, right up until sometimes the very last minute. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that's what, I really set out to show in this exhibition that he's constantly pushing and these most recent works that you're talking about feel very new and they're all they're really ambitious and he just keeps pushing 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 and and that's to me what makes a, a great artist and and what justifies to a, a big exhibition like this where you really can take mm -hmm. visitors on, a, on an amazing tour of somebody's creative life. Well, thank you so much. It's really a fantastic exhibition. I mean, thank I think you. a lot of people know who Murakami is broadly, but I think this shows a side that not everyone is aware of, and it definitely shows the depth. So thank you so much for Good. speaking with me. Thank you. It's fun to thank talk you. about it. We want to thank Michael for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to themodern.org. That's it for Art This Week. Thanks for watching. I still got your polo